I think the best way into Heidegger is to characterize the paradigm that he rejects and presents an alternative to. So yes. the first so the first part of my notes is just a description of the paradigm that Heidegger rejects. That is Cartesian dualism yeah. uh, and, and why it's wrong. Then the next section is what Heidegger's alternative to that is. Then I go into what Sloterdijk adds to Heidegger's account. Then I go into what Heidegger and Sloterdijk have to say about Western civilization and about culture and civilization across space and time. So maybe what we could do is I could begin by I could begin by summarizing the Cartesian dualist paradigm and Heidegger's alternative to it. Then we can stop there and talk about it. Then we can move to Sloterdijk. Then we can move to Western civilization and cultures and civilizations across space and time, if we have time in this conversation. Yeah, okay. That works. Okay, cool. So like I said, I think the best way into Heidegger is to begin with the paradigm that he rejects and that he presents an alternative to. And there are many names we could give to this paradigm, Cartesian dualism, the subject, ob the subject object paradigm, the mapping paradigm, the representation paradigm, the enlightenment paradigm, the modern paradigm. But what is this paradigm? It is the belief that our minds are fundamentally different from the things we are mentally aware of, that the human subject is fundamentally different from the objects he perceives, that thoughts are fundamentally different from reality, that the knower is fundamentally different from the known, that the map maker is fundamentally different from the territory he seeks to map. Now, why reject this paradigm? Well, fundamentally because it's false. Our minds are, in fact, part of reality. The self, the subject, the mind is part of reality. It is not fundamentally separate from or different from reality. And I think most of us get this. There's just not much justification for regarding human consciousness as fundamentally distinct from everything else. But let's give the subject-object paradigm its due. First of all, even if it's obviously wrong at some fundamental level, it's pretty intuitive, at least for some. And it's incredibly practical. When I say it's intuitive, I mean that we, we are all constantly observing and analyzing things and people. And it seems like we're in here in our minds having experiences and the things and people that we're observing and analyzing are separate. If it's a person we're observing, we don't experience their experiences. We assume that they experience them, but we can't. So the subject object paradigm is a pretty good heuristic for describing much of everyday life and observation. And obviously treating the world as external to us, as separate from us, and analyzing it on its own terms is the foundation of modern science, which has proved useful in many ways that we value, even, it, even if it has also caused a huge number of problems for human well-being and for the possibility of continued human civilization and even life. But in the meantime, it has brought us modern medicine and engineering, which the vast majority of people would be very loath to give up. Um, nevertheless, despite all of that, metaphysical dualism is clearly false. Minds are not separate from reality. So what is a more accurate way to describe what is going on with our minds and reality? The phenomenological view is that only minds exist. We know our minds exist because we are conscious. As Descartes put it, I think, therefore I am. But we can't say anything about the ontological status of the objects that appear in our consciousness. All we can say is that objects appear in our consciousness. They might be illusions, they might not be. We can use these objects to do things. We can describe and analyze these objects. That's what science is. But again, we can't say that the objects, including other minds, exist independently of our minds. So that's the view of Husserl, Heidegger's teacher, and it's often criticized for being solipsistic. Um, so whereas Descartes posited the independent existence of subjects and objects, Husserl posited the independent existence of subjects, but not objects. Then Heidegger, Husserl's pupil, comes in and denies the independent existence of both the subject and the object. He breaks completely with the subject-object paradigm. How does he do this? Well, if there are neither subjects nor objects in the world, what is there? What there is, you could say, is a fusing of the two. It's unintelligible to say that one exists without the other. There is no world separate from being. There is no being separate from the world. There is only worlded being, aka being in the world, or worlded beings, aka beings in the world. So philosophers from Descartes to Husserl 
have de-worlded human beings by giving them ontological status independently of the world. Even Husserl does this by stating that the self exists, even if the rest of the world may not. Heidegger seeks to re-world us, to remind us that there is no unworlded being. There is only worlded being. Each of us is born amidst a world. We are thrown into it. We did not choose any aspect of it. The time and place we were born into, the surrounding culture, our parents, our genes. We are thrust into the clearing. Things present themselves to us and we cope. We feel certain ways about what we encounter and we do certain things and say certain things for the sake of something later. We are worlded beings and being is temporal. Of necessity, we are doing something now for the sake of something later. So those are my notes on, again, the paradigm that Heidegger is rejecting and Heidegger's alternative to it. So let me stop there and ask you, what is your take on what I have summarized so far? Sure. Well, actually, what what it is, is uh, his understanding of being a four Honden height. So uh, he introduces in the being in time, uh, once you get past the introduction, he gets right into this nature of these three different types of being. So we should probably define what being means for him. Uh, the word being, it's very vague, abstract, and nebulous. And he has many lectures where he starts out by saying that. Um, it sounds abstract, but what being means for him is that which the sort of unconscious presuppositions in a particular time and place that uh, make anything intelligible to us as such. So that's what being is for him. It's very immanental. Uh, it's very worldly. And uh, it has changed over time uh, quite a bit. He outlines a sort of history of being when he talks about being for the pre-Socratics was this idea of phusis. And phusis is simply entities flashing forth in what he calls the clearing. And the clearing is simply uh, the space of encounter between entities in which truths are made evident, truths multiple, not singular, um, are made evident. And uh, they simply flash forth, arise, and disappear, uh, whether it's an Aximander or Talus or uh, Heraclitus or what have you. And those are the guys, really, that Heidegger likes a lot. But then he says that starting with Plato and Aristotle, we get this transcendent understanding of being for Plato being becomes the forms, the idolins that are sort of up there. And the world is a bad Xerox copy of these perfect crystal and pure spiritual forms that exist in some sort of abstract spiritual phase space. Uh, but this begins this process of transcendentalizing being so that it becomes above the world. And he says that all, from Plato all the way down to Husserl, this has been the, the West's understanding of being, putting objects into these very abstract phase spaces like the Cartesian grid, the XYZ grid, and you plug entities uh, into that and it deworlds them. As you say, it removes them from the context of their horizons, their specific horizons in a particular time and place. And it puts them into this abstract phase space where we can derive all these objective properties from, from these objects. Uh, so that's the goal. That's the reason why these objects are put into this transcendental phase space. Uh, and that's four Honded height. In other words, the understanding of being as self-sufficient entities. Uh, once you get an entity into that phase space, it's not really connected to any other entities. It's It's been deworlded. It's its own thing. And we're just dealing with this one entity. And this includes the West's understanding of the self, right. uh, especially starting with Descartes, with the cogito. Go ahead. Right. So just to be clear, both the object and the subject are de-worlded. Yes, that's right. They, they appear in a sort of abstract phase space, uh, the subject uh, commanding and dictating properties to the object. And that's sort of the thing that he objects to because science takes this understanding of being as the only possible understanding of being and is the only possible way of putting uh, proposals to entities or what he calls insistences. Uh, when I if I hold up a uh, you know a pen and I say this pen is pink, I'm putting an insistence to this pen that it reveal itself as a pink object. But what else is it? Now, if I change the proposition, I can change what whatever it is that the entity is unconcealing to me. So he has this idea of truth then as that's connected with this as unconcealment, aletheia. It's a process whereby you have to sort of imagine entities in the clearing show one side uh, to us and we put certain proposals to those entities uh, 
But then while we're doing that, meanwhile, other properties of the entity, other ways of being have disappeared off the radar. So we're only getting back from the entities what kinds of questions, mostly scientific, that we're putting to the entities. Art puts different questions to those entities because the job of art, and Heidegger agrees with McLuhan pretty much on this, is to create a counter environment, uh, to use McLuhan's term, uh, that makes these other aspects of being that science has shoved out of the picture visible. They become aware. We become suddenly aware of the environments in which we are embedded, in which we have created through the process of our mode of being, which is Dasein. Dasein's mode of being is the human mode of being in the world, but it always has the kind of, it, it's almost, uh, it sounds like a verb, but he, he pretty much means it as a noun, but he pretty much means it as a verb. Because with Dasein, humans are always doing something. We're always engaged in a pre-philosophical understanding of a particular place that we're at. The blacksmith has grown up in this village. He knows exactly how to do his job, what to do, that he's a blacksmith. All of this facticity, what Heidegger calls facticity, which is you're raised in a certain cultural understanding of a place and time, whereas factuality would be like, you know, I was born male. Facticity then would be, well, now I'm insisting I'm a woman because that's the, the, the trans world. Um, so facticity has to do with cultural understanding. And really custom, I mean, we have no nature for Heidegger. Our nature is our is custom. It's what we do. It's always this emphasis on, on doing things. So he kind of takes the West's self-sufficient entity of the transcendental subject that has been deworlded all through philosophy, especially since Descartes, and embeds it back into a world horizon. So that Dasein means self plus world, that the two are engaged together and they're embedded inextricably in a particular time and in a particular place. Um, go ahead, uh, Bryn. Dasein is self plus world, but can't be reduced to either. That is, neither self nor world has independent ontological status. Rather, what there is, is Dasein, which is, I said it's like the fusing of self and world or is, so do you think that that's accurate? Again, if we're just trying to characterize how exactly Heidegger challenges or overturns the subject-object paradigm, I mean, do you think it's accurate to say he says that neither subject nor object, neither subject nor object has independent existence? What has existence, what is, is Dasein, which is a kind of fusion of the two? Yes, I would say that's that's correct. That's That's pretty much correct. And then he mentions one other understanding of being called Zuhand uh, uh, and um, which is ready to hand, whereas Forehand and Height is present at hand, present in an abstract way. Ready to hand is the equipment that we use. Um, it's the understanding of basic technology, not the this other understanding called enframing that he has, which is a degenerate form of technology, um, but rather. Uh, Zuhand and Haidt is, you know, objects refer to other objects. They're embedded in a ref interreferential flow with each other. And if I'm using a hammer, I'm in the flow. But if the head breaks off the hammer, now the object is a problem. It's shifted its mode of being into forehanded height. I have to draw a sort of box around it, problematize it, analyze it, get it fixed and wor working again so that I can then proceed to embed it in my world horizon as a DASA. So those are the three understandings of being that he introduces. Vorhandenheit, Zuhandenheit, and Dasein. And Dasein is the same as existence. It's the existential mode of being in the world that is proper to humans, nothing else. I think we're going to come back to a lot of this, but let's bring in Slaughter, sorry, let's bring in Sloterdijk initially, superficially. So here, here are a couple of my initial thoughts on Sloterdijk and how he relates to Heidegger, and then I want you to respond. So... So I write here that Sloterdijk is something of a Heideggerian. That is, he accepts that there is no fundamental distinction between subject and object. There is only worlded being or being in the world. But he points to a very interesting problem in Heidegger, namely that Heidegger makes it sound like there are individual worlded beings, that each of us is thrown into the world and copes as an individual. Sloterdijk disagrees. Individuals do not have independent existence. No human being ever has been or could be just an individual. From the moment he exists, he is part of an interpersonal relationship with his mother, who in turn is part of some social formation, a band, a tribe, a society, whatever. 
and human individuation can only occur against a background of these relationships and social formation. So human relations, that is relationships and cultures, are ontologically prior to human individuals. And these relationships and cultures are spheres, as Sloterdijk puts it, microspheres in the case of relationships and macrospheres in the case of societies or cultures. Um, and these spheres, these relationships and cultures constitute interiors. They are collective interiors. They are not the world. Rather, they are rituals, institutions, and ideas that give us comfort in the world, that protect us from and immunize us against the world. But again, the key point here is that there are no worlded individual beings. There are only worlded collectivities, whether worlded relationships and friendships, i.e. microspheres, or worlded cultures or civilizations, i.e. macrospheres. And these spheres can be punctured. They can break down, they can collapse. Lovers break up, friends fall out, cultures destroy themselves or are destroyed from without by means of violence or the circulation of sphere destabilizing ideas. Yes, a lot to say about that. One of the things uh, that Sloterdijk says that immediately leaps out at you when you start reading the Spheres trilogy, and he wrote uh, three books uh, near the end of the 90s, early 2000s. Uh, spheres one is Bubbles, which examines microspheres, which are interpersonal dyadic uh, relations one-on-one -on -one with each other. And the first of those is, of course, our relationship with our mother. Um, and then the second volume is Globes, uh, which has to do with these macrospheres uh, that civilizations use to uh, metaphysically immunize themselves. As he puts it, metaphysics is a applied immunology. And then third is foams, uh, which because the collapse of the macrosphere that we had up and running until uh, about the 15th to 16th century collapsed with the rise of the sciences, now we're left with all these little individual spheres. He says uh, the, the immediate image that you can think of uh, is the apartment building with all the different cells, these monk-like cells of individuals, row after row, and, and the very large apartment buildings. Uh, that's foam. That's social foam. Everybody, we've lost a single collective sphere to hold us together with the collapse of the Christian macrosphere. And so now each individual has his own sort of private sphere. This is my sphere right here, the space that I live in inside of this um, apartment. Now, Sloterdijk says that, whereas Heidegger says, when he talks about being in the world and being in, um, he does not mean being in a container, uh, because that for him, being in, a, in a, some type of container, then takes it back to Husserl's ge geometries and mathematics. And he's trying to, Husserl was a mathematician, uh, and he's trying to get away from Husserl and anything to do with Husserl. He's turning Husserl upside down. But for Sloterdijk, that's exactly what it does mean. We're always inside something somewhere, even if it's only a physical structure. But with humans, it's very often a metaphysical structure mm -hmm. of some kind that we're embedded in. We're always embedded in something somewhere. Um, so that's the first point. The other th point th that's interesting to make is that he sort of takes Heidegger's metaphysical age, which Heidegger draws from Plato to Husserl, and he says, uh, this is the metaphysical age. Derrida will call it the logocentric age, same thing. Uh, but then he says, there's there's actually a pre-metaphysical age, though, before that, that Heidegger doesn't talk about, other than the pre-Socratics. Um, but it's pre-metaphysical, and it goes all the way back to Egypt and Sumer, in which being in the world meant being in the body of the great mother. Mm. Uh, the universe is always conceived as inside of a uterine, uh, um, a, a, a uteromorphic, as he puts it, a uteromorphic cosmology as there's always this the earth as this either a flat or a round thing that's surrounded by a body of water so it's very like amniotic fluid almost so that's the pre-metaphysical age and then he says during the metaphysical age what happened was now we have being understood as being in the mind of the father so uh the patriarchal age comes in with the greeks uh, this would correspond to gene gebser's mental consciousness structure where now we're in the mind of the father. And that persists all the way down, of course, to St. Thomas Aquinas and the scholastics with the idea that God is the ultimate ground and guarantor of truth. That is true, which is true in accordance with the ideas that are embedded in the mind of God. So then Sloterdijk says with, with Heidegger's epoch that he discusses the, the period of throneness, 
is a sort of post-metaphysical age mm. in which we uh, are simply thrown into the world and experience uh, a real sense, hence the anxiety issue, a real sense of being outside in the world unprotected by anything for the first time in human history. So it's a crisis, Heidegger's thrownness. Um, it's a crisis. No mother, no father. We're on our own. We're in the age of foams. Um, so he gives that little uh, analogy in uh, that little model in uh, Neither Son Nor Death, the collection of interviews with him that I always recommend to people who want to know where to start with Sloterdijk. I would start with that collection of interviews. One question, just an immediate response to what you said. Is it your understanding that Sloterdijk regards really the early 20th century? We might, we might say the late 19th century or the early 20th century in the West as the period when we went from having a sphere to not having a sphere. In other words, we were we were in the Great Mother from maybe the Neolithic horticultural societies through the first generation of civilizations. Then we were in the Father, beginning with the Greeks and Hebrews, and that really took us through even most most of modern Western history up until Nietzsche announced the death of God and Heidegger presented his description of being. And at that point, we were neither in the mother nor in the father and for the first time did not have a macrosphere. Is that? Yeah. And that um, nailing it down to the 19th century roughly corresponds to Spengler's date for the decline of the West, which he sees beginning in the 19th century. So there's some overlap there. And Sloterdijk has read Spengler and likes him, refers to him a lot. Um, so yeah, the, yeah, the 19th century becomes the troubling period for for the West, with the, the death of God, with Nietzsche, with Kierkegaard struggling uh, to make a leap of faith now, and all his books have nervous titles like Fear and Trembling, <laughs> and the concept of anxiety. Uh, this guy knows there's a problem <laughs> with <Yeah>. his religion. <laughs> it's on the way out is what the problem is. Yeah, um, yeah so he's clinging to it, um, pretty much like a drowning man clinging to a piece of wreckage. Uh, you know, that's what it comes down to. So yeah, the 19th century, it's a big troubling period. It had been going on for centuries, but it's like a, it's like a slow deflation rather than just a sudden pop. It's just like a bubble that just like a tire that's losing its air over those five centuries since Copernicus. And Nietzsche quotes in, in The Will to Power, he says that man since Copernicus has been on an inclined plane in his own self-estimation mm -hmm. since Copernicus. Uh, same thing. Okay, see, th this is really helpful, and I do want to come back to it because I want to get into the question of how both Heidegger and Sloterdijk see Western civilization and its trajectory. And I was a little unclear about, for example, when, according to Sloterdijk, we ceased to inhabit a macrosphere. And y you've helped me understand already what his answer to that is a little better than I did. But uh, I want to come back to it a little bit later and ask you maybe a question or two more about that. Um, just a recap. So at least as I'm as as I have organized this in my notes, I think that there are two really big moves that I've described. The first is to argue that subjects and objects do not exist. Only worlded beings do. That's Heidegger's move. Second, to argue that worlded individual beings do not exist, only worlded relations do. And that's Sloterdijk's move. Um, and I did want to mention here that I think Ian McGilchrist, the British neuroscientist and philosopher we were mentioning earlier, and who I regard as perhaps the most important thinker in the English-speaking world, I think he would be very receptive to, the Heide to Heidegger's move and to Sloterdijk's move. Because... McGilchrist thinks that it is a mistake to treat the world as an object and that it is a mistake to treat parts as more real than wholes. The fact that we treat the world as an object and that we treat parts as more real than wholes, for example, atoms as more real than the higher order entities that atoms make. The fact that we treat the world as an object and treat parts as more real than wholes follows from the fact that we currently privilege the left hemisphere of our brains, not the right hemisphere, which is more in tune with and receptive to reality and more holistic in orientation. Okay, so so John, the, the next bit in my notes, I 
I've entitled Heidegger, Sloterdijk, and Western Civilization. And what I address here, it's relevant to what you just said. So let me quickly run through it, and then I want you to respond to it. So, so far, what I have said, at least, has been descriptive. That is, Heidegger and Sloterdijk describe our situation in the ways I've indicated. Okay, let's assume their descriptions are accurate. The question arises, what are we supposed to do in light of this information? And I think that the answer for both Heidegger and Sloterdijk is pretty similar. And I would summarize it as follows. We should be open and receptive to the world, but within limits. I would say with I say within limits because according to both thinkers, there are problems associated with not being open enough, but there are also problems associated with being too open. So drilling down a little bit, Heidegger's central prescription, if it can be called that, is for us to get out of our own way and open ourselves to whatever manifests itself, whatever shines forth in the clearing. Instead of objectifying what we encounter, as scientists do, or focusing on and expressing how we feel about what we encounter, which is what romantics do, we need to stop objectivizing and stop subjectivizing, get out of the way, and just be present to what is around us. And he did think that he seems to think, or he seemed to think that the Greeks lived in this way. But he also thought, and this I'm getting from Hubert Dreyfus, that you have to pursue this course within the bounds of your culture. You don't want to be kooky or hermetic by abandoning the culture that you're a part of. Instead, you want to make room for presence and authenticity within the parameters allowed by and recognized in your culture. At the same time, you don't want to be totally conformist. If you are, you will sacrifice authenticity and presence. Heidegger also emphasized that if instead of being open to nature, a culture objectifies nature, it will end up encasing the world in man-made infrastructure, which further de-worlds the people in the culture and also threatens the world itself. And that's the situation in the modern West. Now, I think that Sloterdijk's prescription is very similar to Heidegger's. Individuals, groups, and entire cultures should be permeable to the things they encounter on the outside. We should take in each other's feelings and views, and even their bodies in the sexual context. Similarly, cultures should take in elements from other cultures. This receptive tendency is the feminine tendency. The woman receives the man during sexual intercourse, and women are more emotionally permeable and more empathic than men. If people and cultures are impermeable, they will grow lonely and stale. People will become sphere deficient. And Sloterdijk thinks that modern European man has become or became in, impermeable, at least until World War II. That in modern Europe, the individual came to be viewed as complete unto himself, a singularity unto himself, incapable of having ideas channeled through him, inspired or inspirited in him. And by the way, that observation is similar to Thomas Mann's, argu Thomas Mann's argument that ancient man was open from the back, open to inspiration and archetypal energies being channeled through him, while modern man is not. So for Sloterdijk, it's not a coincidence that the genre of portraiture emerged in the modern West. The portrait is the artistic expression of the view that the individual is a world unto himself. So on the one hand, for Sloterdijk, you have a lot of impermeable people in the modern West, and that's a recipe for loneliness and sphere deficiency for those people. But you can also go too far in the other direction. That is, you can be so open that you let in ideas and forces that threaten you. That can happen at the level of relationships, and it can happen at the level of cultures or civilizations. And I think that according to Sloterdijk, the post-Enlightenment the post -enlightenment West had it bad in this way too. That is, due to the emergence and ascendance of science and technology, which have incredible erosive force, we have lost the ability to take any rituals or metaphysical ideas seriously. We no longer inhabit a common cultural sphere, a protective interior. We face reality without protection. It's a cold and brutal state to be in. And I think this may be connected to the discovery in Dutch painting of the sky. The vast sky is almost an ominous character in Dutch painting. So in summary, both Heidegger and Sloterdijk have a critique of Western civilization, or at least a post-Enlightenment Western civilization. According to them, we need to be more open and present to the people and things around us 
and we need a collective interior that comforts and protects us. And to do this, we need to change the way we think of ourselves, and we need to deprioritize our science and, techno and technology, which is not to say we need to get rid of them. The other understanding of being that comes along a bit later with Heidegger in his essay on the question concerning technology is this idea of enframing uh, that science, because it has dictated how entities will be and shall be, so it dictates to them. So its openness isn't very open, actually, because it's approaching entities uh, like a knight in armor who goes out with all these concepts and ideas about how things should be and selectively looks for, you know, a ready combatant that's the equivalent to that knight in his armor. And instead of understanding that the, the entities will unconceal themselves in their own ways, uh, if there is a certain passive receptive openness to entities, they will unconceal themselves and we will learn different things about them, i.e. non-scientific things. Heidegger has engaged his entire career could be summarized as, as as a battle against science. That is really what it is. Um, he completely rejects this idea that science, because it's found up all these great truths, truths plural, again, uh, thinks that it can dictate to the world how entities shall be. And so in this process of enframing, it's really a degenerate form of, of Duhandenheit, which is the mode of equipment. And he's talking here, one, one suspects about farmers and blacksmiths equipment that kind of equipment not the high technological apparatuses of uh, of science which inframes the world with this view that it look when when science looks out on the world it looks for uh, at everything in terms of quantity of standing reserve of potential energy uh, this mountain over here could be mined for uranium uh, this forest over here we could take down those trees put them into the lumber industry. Everything is seen as pure potential for exploitation. So he's really all on the way, one of the first thinkers along with Spengler to be on the way to an environmental sensitivity that will of course lead in the West, uh, in the Anglo West to, with Rachel Carson's uh, book, Silent Spring to the ecological movement. But these guys are really the first to, to begin suspecting that we can't just let science dictate to us how entities shall be because it leads to an impoverishment of being, uh, an impoverishment of Dasein. And furthermore, Dasein, uh, when science reduces human beings to the same being, every we get this average everydayness, what, what he calls, what Heidegger calls Das Mann, the they, where Dasein almost takes on the character for Handenheit, where the others have nothing to do with me. I'm in my own self-sufficient phase space um, and people become disconnected from each other. So um, there's a certain way in which Dasein can encounter fallenness through idle chatter, gossip, uh, knee-jerk opinionating. These are things that cover up truth. Uh, these are things that get in the way of truth, that distort and warp language, which he had this idea that language, in his letter on humanism, language is the shepherd of being. So it's something that, ha that has to be taken care of by artists, in particular, who are primarily the shepherds of being, and for him, primarily the poets like Holderlin. Um, so that's the important thing, um, that, that science not be allowed to dictate to the rest of us that there's only one way of being, that there's only one way of being true in the world. There isn't. Those things are true for science. They might not be true for you or this or that other group. So a, a couple of things in response to that. So first of all, I just wanted to note that I think in Brian McGee's conversation with Hubert Dreyfus, Dreyfus said that most of our activity is unconscious and unreflective, right? So when we're doing something we know how to do, we're not really even aware that we're doing it. We're not aware of the tools that we're using, right? When a, right, when a blacksmith is hammering a nail, he's not really thinking about how he's doing it. He's not even really thinking of the tool as separate, right? He's just doing it unreflectively the same way that you turn a doorknob or drive a car. So most of our activity, most of the activity that is Dasein is this unreflective, in a sense, unconscious activity. But, but then Dreyfus says that according to Heidegger, and I think as, as you have indicated, if something goes wrong, we become rational and problem solving. So for example, if the hammer isn't working on the nail, we might look at the hammer and see if there's some problem with it. 
And then we can even go a step further and break down objects, notice their properties, manipulate them. And that's where we get science and theory. And Dreyfus seemed to indicate that for Heidegger, it's not that there's anything wrong even with science and theory. It's just that, so I guess I'm asking you, do you agree that that's Heidegger's view? It's not that there's anything wrong with science and theory. It just shouldn't pretend to be the only mode of knowing. Is it more I, of that? Yeah, it's just one truth among many other kinds of truth. When I say that he's engaged in a battle against science, um, part of that is motivated by a battle against Husserl, his mentor, whom uh, you you eventually have to turn against your mentor in order to become a unique individual. Otherwise, you just become a clone, a, a Jungian, let's say, uh, instead of Lacan or somebody like that who can create their own worldview. Uh, Jungians don't have the courage to do that. They just quote the master, just quote the master. The master's already pre-thought out everything for you. So you don't have to do any thinking. You just quote the master, just like a religious cult. Um, same exact mentality. So there's no room for individual thinking. So you have to break away from the mentor. Um, but he would say, I think that, yeah, science is one set of truths uh, amongst many other sets of truths. And it isn't the only thing. It's done a lot of damage to the West's uh, understanding of being uh, in distorting it into this idea of enframing, that everything is just there for science to use to translate into energy so we can keep on doing that. I mean, what's the purpose? What's the goal here? Whereas for art, and Heidegger was very fond of art, although not modern art, of course, uh, but he liked art quite a great deal. And he thought that the artist is the one who, uh, whether it's a poet, a musician, a sculptor, or whatever, um, through what he calls an aragness event, which is a sudden uh, explosion of a new set of practices and principles, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey are uh, together, an Aragnus event. A whole new set of principles is unconcealed and unveiled for the Greeks to follow, which they then do for centuries before they that becomes semantically depleted. Um, but yeah, so that's the important thing about art for, for Heidegger is that uh, it, it, it unconceals truths that, that are missed by science or might be missed before science by other modes of being but uh, the artist is, is the one who creates, and for him too, as for Spengler, and he's read Spengler and liked him, uh, art is the primary foundational thing that brings about a new understanding of being for an entire epoch in the first place. Mm. So that's, it, it comes from art, not science. Science is a latecomer uh, to this. Science, science comes straggling along and creates a secularized view of whatever it is, secularized Christianity, let's say, as Nietzsche would put it. Science creates a secularized form of Christianity. It still has kind of the same values, uh, but it just doesn't have the same transcendental signifies. The cross, uh, cross, death, and grave, as he put it when he first became interested in Schopenhauer. Um, so no, that yeah, that's how I would put it there. Yeah, so a, a couple things in response to that. First of all, it might be more, It, I mean, you may disagree, but it sounds to me, based on what you're saying, like, it would be more accurate to say that Heidegger was waging a war against scientism, not against science. Yes. Yeah. That's more yeah. accurate. Yeah. yeah. Um, Good clarification. Yeah. Scientism. Yeah. I also just want to understand and respect scientists, uh, science. Uh, this isn't some new age idiot who thinks, the <laughs> intellect, you know, the intellect is worthless. Science has raped all of us. Uh, it, it's not that way. He's not that simple minded. <laughs> right. Um, also, I just wanted to note I, I, what you said about, I can't remember exactly how you put it, but basically that artists play a more important or more fundamental role in relating to being and shaping culture than scientists do. And I just wanted to note that Hubert Dreyfus said something similar to Brian McGee, and he said in particular, poets are kind of on the cutting edge of being, according to Heidegger, he said, because he thought language played such an important constitutive role in, I guess, creating... <laughs> creating a world picture yeah right um, that's why he says uh, in his book on uh, on boredom he gave a lecture cycle on boredom which you think would be boring to read but it's actually not it's really <laughs> insightful it's kind of uh, he, he brought it out i think after he finished being in time which analyzes anxiety and for him dasein is nothing if not mood because mood tints and colors everything so anxiety is a mood and uh, boredom is a mood. But w w within this, he's talking about three different types of uh, ways of entities responding to world. And he says that a rock has no world. 
Uh, there are, no world exists for rocks, stones, mineralogy, nothing like that. The animal, however, is poor in world. The animal does have world, but only world as it is relevant to that animal. For example, he says, the beetle, as it goes along a blade of grass, cannot see the blade of grass as an entity in and for itself, but at, merely as a way path for the beetle to, to move somewhere. The lizard sunning itself on a rock sees the rock as a place for a lizard to sun itself on the rock. That's all it cares about. So it's very poor in world, whereas there's an abyss of difference between humans and animals because humans have language. And for him, language is the house of being. Language is the sacred thing that humans have that enables them. It's, it's the tools that enables human beings to construct worlds. And so we are rich in worlds. And it's, of course, the artists, poets, artists, sculptors, painters, musicians for Heidegger that create these worlds. Um, science and technology is a, is a late development. So in that respect, he does agree pretty much with, with Spengler's general overall view. Uh, it's just that, and this is surprising to me because he, early on he has read Spengler in his career, uh, and Spengler's whole thing was to uh, institute what he called a Ptolemaic revolution instead of uh, what he called the Copernican way of re revolving, of thinking of all of history revolving around the West with this ridiculous ancient medieval modern scheme. Uh, and his idea was that the Ptolemaic idea is that there are these nine different civilizations and the world revolves around each one of these, mm -hmm. each one in and for itself. Uh, but Heidegger never really gets out of that ancient medieval modern scheme. I was going to note the same a little later. Heidegger seems to regard the Greeks and the Christians as earlier stages in our civilization, yes. not as distinct civilizations as right. Spengler would characterize them, right? The the classical and then the Magian. Um, classical, Magian, and Faustian. Right. Yeah, exactly. Three different ways of being in the world, three different Daseins, basically. Uh, but Heidegger doesn't ever present it that way. One thing I just wanted to note in passing is that, yeah, I learned from one of the McGee conversations that according to Heidegger, Dasein, that is the directed activity that is our life, <laughs> um, has a threefold structure. And the first part, the first component of the threefold structure is mood and disposition. That is, we're thrown into the world and basically we feel certain ways about it of necessity. There's no state before being in a mood there is no being without being in a mood and then after that you know you use things you talk about what you're doing for the sake of something in the future but mood is the first component of the activity that we are all engaged in and of course it could be a, a positive mood a negative mood and there are many obviously distinct kinds of moods that you say boredom anxiety joy etc <laughs> The Greeks experienced the emergence of all things, the opening and showing and shining forth of all things to us. They enjoyed a special relation to nature, not just a subjective feeling or sentiment for nature, which was the prevailing characteristic of the modern romantic, and not as an object for a subject, which developed out of the scientific mode of thinking inaugurated by Descartes, rather an immediate experience of nature with an emphasis on the word immediate, unencumbered by the incessantly mediating subject. This subjecticity is at the foundation of the modern age. Modern romanticism and modern science are united by this underlying assumption that the foundation for thinking and feeling is the self, the subject. And a little later, Capobianco quotes Heidegger, who wrote, quote, the Greeks are those people who lived immediately in the manifestness of phenomena through the specifically ecstatic capacity of letting the phenomena speak to them. Modern man, Cartesian man, speaks only to himself. For the Greeks, things appear. For Kant, things appear to me. There is a cleavage here. When Heidegger says the metaphysical age from Plato to Husserl, um, and then before that we have a different understanding of being with Fusus, which is closer to this immediate uh, understanding, um, there is a cleavage insofar as with Descartes introducing the cogito, we get the emphasis on subjectivity, which becomes a new and different thing that the Greeks never had. Uh, they, they just simply didn't. You could say that they didn't discover the subject, and you wouldn't be exaggerating that much. Um, but the discovery of the subject by, by Descartes with the cogito becomes uh, a very important thing 
for Western philosophy from him all the way down to Husserl. Uh, for Kant, it becomes the transcendental unity of apperception. For Fichte, uh, the, the whole world becomes something that is posited from out of the self, which is his version of the absolute, whereas the not self is uh, everything out there, all that stuff out there that he sort of waves his hand at. Uh, so the self is, pre is a pretty important entity. And Heidegger sort of tackles it. He's really the first, I think, to, to tackle it and sort of bring it back down to the earth, this floating bubble of forehandenheit subjectivity, to bring it back down to the earth and embed it in particular world horizons. But also in his essay on the essence of truth, when he's talking about his theory of the clearing and aletheia and entities unconcealing themselves, not the way that he's putting that, unconcealing themselves. So the autonomy mm. is shifting to the entity. He's, he's sort of, you almost don't even notice it. It's like a sleight of hand. Uh, it's not the subject for Heidegger that has all the autonomy anymore. It's the object. In a way, he's going back to Fusis, where entities flash forth and unconceal themselves, as though it were entirely up to them uh, to reveal to us what they're going to reveal, and we simply copy it down. Um, so that's the difference the, in, in the, emphasizing the subject or de-emphasizing it in these two phases of the metaphysical age here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Th that, that's great what you just said. And I wanted to add to it that I think that Heidegger thinks that the highest form of being is not doing or expressing, but letting, right? which is, again, letting be. Be. things unconceal themselves. One question going back like 20 or 30 minutes. So I think I suggested in my written comments that according to Sloterdijk, the emergence and ascendance of science destabilized the macrosphere in, the, in modern Europe. Is that your understanding? Because I have yeah. not read Sloterdijk. I'm getting this from various sources including your videos on him but i could have gotten that wrong so i thought it might be useful briefly to discuss sloterdijk's view of science well it's um, interesting yeah since copernicus basically that's that's when um the tire ran over the nail let's say <laughs> now it's got five <laughs> centuries uh to deflate <laughs> something something like that um but it's interesting with regard to this whole ontology of spheres we have to recall that Prior to Copernicus, the whole universe was considered to be inside of a series of concentric spheres, uh, these spheres. And each one of these spheres was made out of uh, ether, which has uh, the property simply of turning in circular motion naturally. That's, that's simply what it does. And they're crystalline. Uh, each one makes a different note of the diatonic scale, and each one has a different planet embedded within it, like an air bubble, let's say, in a glass sphere. And as that sphere turns, it carries that air bubble along with it. Um, so that's how the machinery of the cosmos worked up to Copernicus. And uh, every, the Earth is at the center of all of that. So in a way, Sloterdijk is going back and retrieving this sphere's ontology, but doing it in a very ingenious philosophical way, uh, a post-metaphysical way. Uh, Sloterdijk is not, you know, he, he is not quite as academic, although he is an academic, of course, as Heidegger in the sense that uh, this guy spent some time in India studying with Osho, the, this uh, Indian mystic. Uh, so he's open to other modes and understandings of being, and he's taken in postmodern, French postmodern thought as well, which he's fully cognizant of and well aware of. So it's a different world. By, by the time we get to Sloterdijk with his fusion of German thought, French thought, and a bit of Indian thought, a smattering of it, not a whole lot of it, but some, and um, so it's a different, it's a different world. It's, it is much more open. It is a world where that Christian macrosphere, that Christian slash classical macrosphere uh, has popped. Mm. And really the last portrait of it that you get uh, it is right in the year 1500, Hieronymus Bosch, the outer panels of the Garden of Earthly Delights. If you fold them in, you get the earth on the inside of a crystalline sphere, uh, a perfect crystalline sphere. It's a flat disc surrounded by water and with a god as a little tiny puppet being all the way in the corner manifesting the logos the word that becomes creation after that uh it's over copernicus pops it and then it moves on down down there down from there with kepler's laws of motion galileo's laws of falling bodies and newton's universal uh, gravitation and so forth okay so you would say then that 
even though, as we said earlier, the sphere is only gone as of, say, the late 19th or early 20th centuries, it's in a process of eroding during the entire modern period. Yes. Right. So it's like, so, so we go from being inside the Great Mother, which is roughly Neolithic through the first generation of civilizations. Then we're in the mind of the father, beginning with the Greeks and the Hebrews, up through, it's really up, it, it's, it's really up until 1500 in the West, but then it lasts. But again, as you said, it's like the, 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 <laughs> the tire that is being inside God the Father goes over the nail that is modern science and rationalism around 1500 and then it's dead like the, the tire is completely flat by 1900 something like that right. yeah. yeah yeah all right so i said at the outset that metaphysical dualism is false and by the way that's a widely held view now that metaphysical dualism is false the mind is not fundamentally separate or different from the world but there's a key additional point about the relationship between the mind and the world namely the features of our mind determine what aspects of reality we can see. The features of the seer affect what is seen. There are some things that all human minds have in common that affect what we can all see. Immanuel Kant may be the most well-known exponent of this position. He was the first to give it legs in his critique of pure reason. Although he continued to accept the subject-object paradigm, he pointed out that we as subjects do not have unmediated access to reality. Rather, what we see is mediated by the nature of our minds, which funnel reality through the categories of quantity, quality, relation, and modality, which see the world in terms of space, time, and causality. But of course, at the same time that all human minds have certain characteristics in common, per Kant, human minds in practice also differ from each other. Cultures vary across space and time, and within a given culture, individuals and subgroups have different concepts and assumptions across space and time. So no two individuals and no two cultures will see or can see the same things. And that is very relevant to our discussion of civilization. As we know, Spengler believed that every civilization had its own world picture and saw the world through the lens of its world picture. Gebser believed that this proceeded chronologically, that collective consciousness has changed over time, going from magic to mythic to rational to integral. As far as I can tell, and here I'm going to stop, both Heidegger and Sloterdijk have very complementary ideas. Heidegger is the first to decentralize the subject, to step down the subject, bring it back down to the ground, to a particular time and a particular place, and also to question this idea that there's only one mode of being in the world, one mode of understanding what is true. There are plenty of different modes of being. Different cultures have different being understandings. And I think he would uh, agree with that. I remember reading somewhere him talking about the different Daseins of the different civilizations. And uh, even somewhat consistent with Gebser, I think this is even in Being in Time where he's talking about uh, primitive Dasein has uh, their own understanding of being. Um, and then there's a mythical Dasein uh, by which I presume he means high civilizational Dasein mm. that has its own understanding of being. And then the modern Dasein, that's in being in time. So Dasein, people tend to think that he just means one thing, that it's just one, it's the human mode of being in the world. But he means by it a plurality of different kinds of modes, although he usually does speak of it as though it were just the human mode that distinguishes us from animals and rocks. This is This is complicated territory. So Dreyfus said that basically in Being in Time, which is Heidegger's early work, he described being in the world in universal terms and thought that he was doing so. And then in his or later less. work, yeah. or less. and that in his later work, he turned and began to emphasize that being in the world actually differed from epoch to epoch. And I think he even concluded later that in his earlier work, he had mistaken being in the world in the modern West for universal being in the world. Because in his later work, as we've talked about a little bit, he expresses great appreciation for the Greeks, claiming that they were comparatively open and receptive to being natural, rooted, settled. They appreciated beauty and heroism. That the Christians who followed were different. They fundamentally distinguished between God and his creation, and God's creation just was being in the world. That is, his creation was the entire cosmos, 
and all the creatures within it, including themselves, and the Christians revered saints, not heroes, while reviling sin. And then comes modern Western man, who is also different. As we've seen, he views himself as a subject with desires to satisfy, and the world as a set of objects to control and use. And modern Western culture, in stark contrast to Greek culture, is unsettled, rootless, nihilistic, and removed from nature by its by its technology. So even though Heidegger, in contrast to Spengler, seems to think that the Greeks and then the Christians and then the modern West, it's all the same culture, whereas Spengler would say, no, these are just three different cultures. He's similar to Spengler in that he's really focusing on, in his later work, the different world pictures of different, at least civilizational epochs. Yep. And that is more true, you're right, about the later Heidegger of, of the turn, starting with the introduction to metaphysics in 1936. That's what I was trying to remember. Uh, when he starts articulating this concept of the metaphysical age, but yet it's also composed of these different under, different epochs where being is understood differently. It's understood as phusis for the pre-Socratics, as the forms for Plato. Uh, then by the time of Christianity, we get this understanding uh, that being becomes collapsed into a being, uh, logos, whereas for, for Heraclitus, Logos had been a cosmic structuring principle that was universal throughout, uh, whereas with Christianity, it collapses into a being, the Logos, the word made flesh, uh, and Heidegger isn't very comfortable with that and doesn't really like it, uh, but then he identifies all the way down to the scholastics, the understanding of being as that which is true in the mind of God. Then we get the Vorhandenheit, understanding of being that is stepped up. It had been there since Plato, he says. But it is stepped up with Descartes' discovery of the cogito, where it becomes even more intense, the subject-object distinction on the one hand, and also taking objects and entities and deworlding them by putting them into mathematical phase space, Cartesian phase space, as it's, as it's even called. Um, he's sort of the first to create this three-dimensional depth perspectival uh, geometrical phase space with his fusion of geometry and algebra and the creation of analytical geometry. And yeah, it becomes eminently compatible. And most of these guys were scientists, um, what were called natural philosophers. They were scientists. Descartes made huge contributions to the sciences, as did Kant, as did Leibniz, all of these guys. And so they all presuppose this understanding of Vorhandenheit, of entities being deworlded, whether it's subject versus object or whether it's just an object that we're putting into that space. But of course, we are subjectivities deriving from that object, its so-called objective properties. But according to Kant, those properties that we're deriving that are, quote, objective, are objective only within the rules of the game of science. Um, so for an object to be true, it has to be filtered through those four categories, quantity, quality, relation, and modality. And relation is the most important of them because that retrieves the old substance accident ontology that had, had used to be associated in Aristotle with uh, pure, the... the um, the uh, su substance accident ontology of self-sufficient entities uh, for Aristotle. And then so by the time we get down to Kant, you have to play by the rules of science. It has to be substance accident, cause effect, and then their reciprocity. Those are the subcategories of relation. Uh, and those are the most important categories as Schopenhauer figured out when he drew a, a circle around it. And he said, we can leave the rest of these categories aside because substance accident and even substance accident and reciprocity he gets rid of. It's just cause effect. That's yeah. space, time, and causality are the forms that even animals have. Otherwise, they couldn't make sense out of the external world around them. So even they have it a priori equipped the moment they come into the world, uh, not just human beings. I think, though, actually, that Schopenhauer has misunderstood Kant. I don't think um, this is a subtlety here, but I don't. What Kant was talking about was what constitutes an object for the sciences to be true. Mm. He's talking about the sciences here, not the average guy walking down the street trying to make sense out of what he's looking at, which is how Schopenhauer misinterprets it to mean. So he shrinks it down. I think it's possible that you could make the argument that Kant is also saying that, since we all presuppose these categories. But he's really talking about the sciences. And if you read his book, The Metaphysical Foundations of the Natural Sciences, this becomes glaringly evident that these are the categories a priori that science puts to the world mm. in insistence, as Heidegger would call it, on how entities should and therefore must unconceal themselves to be real.
uh, different emphasis than what Schopenhauer uh, with his uh, Lockean-influenced British pragmatism, pragmatism brings in and sort of shrinks it down to. Mm -hmm. And maybe the, one of the reasons, too, why Schopenhauer isn't all that popular with the Academy. Um, he's the first of these philosophers after Kant, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel uh, and the, to inherit that tradition. He's sort of the latecomer to the party. He publishes The World as Will and Representation in 1818. Uh, nobody read it except Goethe. Goethe loved it, but nobody else did. And um, he arrived late to the party, but even Heidegger is sort of bashes him a bit. As you're reading, uh, he's talking about the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason, as really Schopenhauer's only properly academic text. Um, and he sort of has a condescending attitude toward him. So it's very clear that the Academy never really ever took this guy seriously. The only popularity he ever had, I think, was with artists like Thomas Mann and Wagner and uh, the populace, uh, the, po the populace at large, because uh, they liked all of his very frank, pragmatic essays uh, on women, on suicide, on metempsychosis, which is another word for reincarnation, which he apparently seems to have embraced in his later years, uh, and so forth. So interesting the way all this got worked yeah. out. We've been studying all this in my my school and our history of German idealist philosophy. Now we're all the way down to Nietzsche. So it's been fascinating to go back through all these guys that I haven't read in 10 years yeah. and go back through them and reread them. And we've been having very lively discussions. So, well, and, of, and of course, Nietzsche is the one exception, the philosopher or writer or thinker who was greatly influenced by Schopenhauer. But Yes, exactly. Nietzsche is the one exception. Yeah, that's right. So, so maybe to close the discussion, we could shift from Heidegger to Sloterdijk with respect to these grand civilizational questions and I actually think Sloterdijk may be more interesting in, in that context, although I could be wrong. I say that because, and I'll just briefly go through this. This is the last bit of my notes. Uh, he has interesting things to say about how Western culture has changed over time, which you and I have talked about a bit, how the West differs from non-Western cultures, for example, Buddhist culture, and maybe most interestingly, how human society has changed over tens or hundreds of thousands of years. So just drilling down a bit, in Sloterdijk's view, in pre-modern Western culture, people inhabited a comforting protective sphere or interior, and they had hollow permeable selves, both good things. But in the post-enlightenment period, we developed hard impermeable selves and lost our comforting protective sphere, both bad things. So that might be how you would summarize Sloterdijk's description of the trajectory of our civilization. And our hard, impermeable selves are in contrast to Asian cultures, where to this day, the individual is not a world unto himself or a singularity unto himself. And I think, John, that you noted that in one of your videos that at least in Buddhist cultures, portraits of kings and emperors reflect this. That is, they are made to look like the Buddha, not their distinct selves. Right. Um, yeah. And finally, uh, and, and as I said, perhaps most interestingly, Sloterdijk thinks that over a much larger expanse of time, human societies have gone from being inside the Great Mother to being inside God the Father or the mind of God the Father to being outside of both. And just to say a little more about that, his view is that before the Greeks and Hebrews, that is before Toynbee's second generation of civilization, human societies were in the womb or inside the great mother. Then with the Greeks and Hebrews, there was a break. The source of creation became God the Father. Zeus creates Athena out of his head. Yahweh speaks the cosmos into being. And from that point until the conclusion of the post-enlightenment period in the West, as we've discussed, in other words, from Plato to Husserl, we were in God the Father. But now God is dead. Nietzsche announces the death of God. And we are outside the mother and the father. We are suspended out into the nothing, shellless, unprotected. That's where we are now. And I think one point you made in your conversation is that you can map inside the great mother onto Gebser's mythical, inside the mind of the father, into Gebser's rational, second generation of civilization, Greeks and the Hebrews, and then I, I guess Gebser's more optimistic about the present, although, and that he thinks that in the West, we have attained this integral state, whereas 
at least some sphere, by the way. Hmm. Gebser calls the integral a sphere, hmm. an integral sphere that uh, unites, or as Kant would put it, gives synthetic unity to the manifold of the disparateness of all the phenomena of modernist art, architecture, culture, thought. Uh, for Gebser, it's all in a sphere, an integral sphere, which Sloterdijk, who presumably has never read Gebser or heard of him, I've never seen any reference, uh, sees that as just a semiotic vacancy. Mm. You know, the sphere has popped uh, and we're thrown. We're out unprotected with nothing. Uh, so that's, Gebser and Sloterdijk do not agree on the condition of modernity. I, I think I remember you saying at some point that Sloterdijk has some idea that's sort of similar to Gebser's integral phase. That is, I could be imagining this, but I seem to remember you saying about Sloterdijk that he thinks it would be ideal if people or societies or our society could learn to be both in the womb and outside it. In the womb, meaning in that kind of non-dual, no subject-object distinction state, and simultaneously in the out, out, outside the womb, where maybe that means of a more modern scientific mind. I could be getting that totally wrong, but I seem to remember him having some concept like that and you saying that it was somewhat analogous to Gebser's integral phase. Am I, does that land at all or? It's not ringing a bell. Okay. To be honest, I can't remember that mm -hmm. anywhere. So here's one question then. So how would you explain what Sloterdijk means by being in the womb? And for example, did that start with the matrifocal Neolithic societies where familial homes were created and fertility cults of blood sacrifice emerged? Or does it go back even further into the Paleolithic, being I, in the you know, womb? To be honest, he doesn't clarify. Hmm. In the passage that I'm talking about, in Neither Sun Nor Death, he just says there's this pre-metaphysical epoch where being in the world meant being in the body of the Great Mother. He doesn't really elaborate on it beyond that. So um it seems to be an all-inclusive concept maybe he would include the paleolithic but i do think though that the emphasis would rhyme very well with gebser's uh bringing in the mythical consciousness structure in the middle of the neolithic um which is where you know the the goddess religions really start taking off with mm. the rise of, as we've investigated we don't need to go over it uh ad nauseum but um yeah so i'm not sure that he would make a distinction between paleolithic being in the great mother and of course they did have, though they weren't agrarian, they did have the great mother, all these great goddess statuettes that they have. Right, exactly. Are, are beautiful. Uh, some of the world's first incredible works of art. Most of them are very small. You can hold them in the palm of your hand. And um, so they did have a concept of the great mother. So maybe. And lower, even as far back as lower Paleolithic burial practices suggest a conception of Mother Earth, right? Like yeah, the red ochre? That one where they're at, at a puerca in Spain, right, getting back to like 500,000 BC, where there, it's just a hole in the ground, and they're the the, the uh, pre Neanderthals, they're called Homo heidelbergensis, are throwing their dead into this hole in the ground that does suggest a, a, a womb tomb analogy already. Uh, it might be 500,000, but it might be a little more recent than that, uh, maybe conservatively 300,000 years ago. but. Uh, so that's already the thinking in terms of, you know, when you die, you go back to the womb. Right. So and like the red little... ochre that you mentioned as right. well as a symbol for menstrual blood, because um, it, it simply means uh, that when a woman becomes pregnant, she stops menstruating. They thought they, that her body was using that blood to build the new fetus. So likewise, when you put the dead in a grave, you need to sprinkle uh, something like menstrual blood, blood on it, red ochre, namely. To so that the within this womb tomb uh, or this womb like tomb, <laughs> the, <laughs> you, you would get a new a new man, a new body, uh, which does suggest reincarnation. Uh, I don't know what the Paleolithic believed regarding that, but it, it is suggestive of that. Why does this person need a new body if you're going to sprinkle red ochre on it? Uh, if if it's not the case that you're expecting that person to return into into a new body, mm -hmm. uh, so it's very possible. Yeah, I, I'm confused about this because, first of all, yes, I mean, it's, I also thought of the the Venus of Villendorf figurines, which are, what, 20,000 years old, so 
so upper Paleolithic, but but then going back into the lower Paleolithic, as you say, there there's evidence that there was some conception of Mother Goddess, Mother Earth, and I guess what's confusing me is if we're trying to give a chronology of human society, and we're saying that it goes from being in the mother to being in the father, I think what would make sense to me currently is that being in the mother would go back before the mythical to the magical. So really to the beginning of human society. Yeah, and that corresponds to Gebser's idea that the magical is a point like unity where everything is just one interconnected whole. Non-dual, right. Yeah, non-dual basically, exactly. Which right. he is analogizing, remember, to deep dreamless sleep where again, you're in a non-dual state of consciousness, which again is analogous to, one would think, a fetus in its mother's womb. It's right. got to be a similar kind of consciousness where there is no sense of subjectivity. Although I will say that in Sloterdijk, uh, as you're reading Bubbles and you get to those later chapters where he starts talking about gynecology uh, and being in the mother's body, he doesn't. He says there is a kind of subjectivity that is mm. there uh, in the womb that is present um i forget what he calls it uh but there is he does say that the fetus has a form of subjectivity with, within the the uh, the womb go ahead but he says there are no objects there are only nobjects nobjects is what i was trying to think of yeah, yeah. he says that it's it's a nobjective awareness <laughs> <laughs> but that's interesting it puts a little spin on things there it's uh, and plants too you know they're not they're sort of in that same category uh but they're not totally unconscious they know where the sunlight is they know how to get to it and they figure it out, you know, so there is some kind of subject object uh, dichotomy there. But would you, so just playing with this, this idea for a little longer. So if we're kind of going from feminine to masculine over time, we, we could say the magical consciousness structure, feminine, the rational or mental consciousness structure, masculine, you've got mythic in between, but then then we would have to disaggregate mythic. So for example, the myths of the Neolithic garden cultures were very feminine, right? Fertility cults. Woman was nature. She gave birth to people. <laughs> she gave birth to babies. She was responsible for life. And she and Mother Earth gave birth to the crops that provided sustenance. So matrifocal societies, fertility cults of blood sacrifice, familial homes, Neolithic society... That's mythic, but then later mythic, like the let's say the first generation of civilizations, those were not matrifocal myths, right? So it's almost like mythic, mythic is the in-between period. We say magical feminine, mental masculine, mythic initially feminine, then gets more masculine until you just get into rational. There are in the mythical, I agree, there are a lot of gray areas where it becomes a matter of emphasis. Like you're saying there. Uh, with the Neolithic, and we get Maria Gambutis's world of what she calls Old Europe, which is matrifocal, matrilinear, and predominantly goddesses are, are the predominant thing that is being worshipped. Uh, but then we have those Indo-Aryans, those troubling Indo-European Indo-Aryans, which are aggressively masculine. Um, they invent mano a mano combat. They invent the, the, the axe that you have to hold and get off your horse and get into combat against your opponent with. Uh, they preferred that to bows and arrows. Um, so we've got those guys bringing in a, a very strong masculine mythical consciousness that, that comes in, that becomes much more important for the second generation of high civilization on Toynbee's model than for the first generation. But still, there are, you know, the Gilgamesh epic that's produced uh, 1700 BC, about the time of Hammurabi, is very much based on a rejection of the goddess. Uh, Gilgamesh rejects Inanna, uh, mm. who by that time becomes Ishtar, uh, rejects Ishtar. So it's, it's very strongly masculine there, even though it's still in that first generation, but it is coming toward the tail end there with Gilgamesh. So um, yeah, there, it's, yeah, it's, it's not a simple thing. It's yeah. complicated too, because right, the Indo-Aryans were, they were very masculine. And of course that had to do with the fact, I think that they were nomadic hunters and their society was male dominated whereas the, the neo control horse right uh, exactly like men did everything possibly and shoot your bow and arrow from the back of the horse uh so it requires a lot of masculine brawn R right whereas you right in the neolithic garden societies women at least prior to the plow participated in agriculture 
in addition to giving birth. So they were much more pottery, pottery, oh, pottery and also, pottery right? Designs and weaving baskets, and uh, you know, you get this constant sense of uh, the feminine being associated with things that are woven and shaped over time, weaving, weaving, weaving. This in later mythology becomes the spider goddess. So that anytime you encounter a spider goddess or a spider uh, mythical entity, it's almost always female, a goddess, because it's associated with weaving. Mm. Women weaving on the loom are kind of like the spider weaving its web. Uh, and so that gives to, yeah, a, a female emphasis on the spider, Ride which is turned upside down in Marvel Comics with Spider-Man. That should really be Spider-Woman, who oh, was a oh, fascinating. Southwestern Native American figure. There was a Spider-Man in, in Southwestern Native American myth, but you hardly ever encounter him. Uh, it's mostly the, the Spider-Woman, Spider-Woman, Spider-Woman. So that's part of the paternal inheritance from mm. the patriarchal overturning of those um those myths it's the very male dominated nature of indo-aryan nomadic society is responsible for their more masculine mythos well the magical consciousness structure is all hunting and gathering and that too is very male dominated yeah so that also complicates the picture right because we i was i was playing with the idea that magical is feminine mental is masculine mythic is in between but one problem with saying that the magical consciousness structure is feminine is that all of those societies were, again, hunting and gathering societies that were male dominated, like the Indo-Aryans. So this is why I was kind of unclear on what for Sloterdijk being in the great womb referred to, like what period of time are we talking about? You know? um, I presume just that first civilization and possibly the Neolithic um... Yeah. I don't know. He's still alive. We should hunt him down and ask him about the Paleolithic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John. Well, uh, before before we close, is there any are there any final reflections? Maybe just like stepping back a bit um, from everything that we've talked about. Anything yeah. that you would like to close sure. with, or a couple of things um, in teaching this class that I've been teaching on the history of German idealist philosophy through Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, Schopenhauer, uh, and now we're on Nietzsche, and I see Nietzsche as well as Rudolf Steiner, for two totally different reasons, and Oswald Spengler, and Heidegger, and also Sloterdijk as children of German idealist thought. Hmm. Because I think if you deleted that epoch of German idealist thought, these thinkers would not exist. So they are coming out of a continuum, out of a stream that that begins really with Kant, although you could argue Leibniz uh, but before him, but definitively with Kant. Um, that produces them. And Sloterdijk is a living representative who has inherited that tradition of this, the study of form, what Spengler calls morphology, borrowing from Goethe. Sloterdijk keeps that term and uses it in the same way and realizes that what he is doing is postmodern morphology. This is how you do cult German culture morphology under the conditions, let's say the environmental conditions of postmodernity, uh, which he has factored in and taken into account very well. Um, instead of turning his nose up at it, as these other Germans would have done. So um, there's a definite continuity. And as a result of that, after we do our class on Nietzsche, we will be doing a course on at my school on Rudolf Steiner, and then one on Heidegger. And we're going to follow that by going through all of Sloterdijk's Spears books. The whole trilogy we'll, we'll read or try to read in eight weeks. I don't know. That's pretty ambitious, but well, uh, we'll see what we can do. One question in response to that, though. So the word morphology never came up. It didn't come up in any of my remarks, and I don't think you used it. So can you say just a little bit more about... Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's uh, So Goethe coins this term morphology to mean the study of forms. Wait, sorry. Means... Wait, sorry. John, sorry to interrupt. Just just to be clear, though, on what I'm asking. Like, so I mean, we, you and I have talked a fair amount about what morphology means and how Spingler oh. has a morphological account of culture civilizations but what i mean is how sloterdijk actually substantively inherits that like what is it in sloterdijk's ooh? Oh, because everything for sloterdijk is the study of form and he says this that that uh, the the major influence on spengler isn't his pessimism on my work but it's the study of forms his mor morphological approach to the understanding of culture where sloterdijk looks at things in terms of their forms he wants to know what what architecture means uh, insofar as it's a substitute for the womb, let's say. Everything is sort of, um, he sees metaphysics as applied immunology, but it's, it's connected with this womb-like idea of uh, forms being protective for him. We're always situated within something somewhere. Uh, 
we're not just like Heidegger says, doing something somewhere. We're always within some kind of interior, whether it's physical or a metaphysical world interior. We're always in something. Um, his book, which is an out outtake from uh, Foams, I believe, or no, Globes, called it's called uh, In the World Interior of Capital, uh, which is a fantastic title where he talks about capitalism being inside this world interior that started with the Crystal Palace in 1851, I believe, in England, uh, with this translucent Crystal Palace that's built, that becomes the world interior of capital until it's displaced. Um, and he thinks that a better model would have been the arcades, which were up and running before them, Walter Benjamin's arcades, which he studied also in the 1830s. They were up and running in Paris before that. He thinks that's a better model for, for capitalism than this global crystal shopping mall, this global crystal palace as a shopping mall uh, that we tend to think about when we think of capital. We're in the flow and we're within this global crystal palace. Um, that palace has shattered though now, so in late capitalism. But yeah, he means form in the sense that he's always studying uh, some kind of architectural manifestation or a or cartography uh, in the middle of of uh, Sphere's book, Two Globes, he goes into a long discussion of the history of how globes were first made and invented, uh, the Baha'im globe and so forth with the discovery of the new world uh, that forced uh, maps from being two-dimensional to being uh, to being almost three-dimensional as you add in the, the new world. And then you have this round, morphologically, almost uterine shaped once again. And at first it's mostly made up out of water uh, which then shifts later on to air. And when, by the time you get to the 20th century, air with the pirating of airships and planes and rockets, uh, air becomes the more important uh, elements for form uh, than water did uh, during the mm -hmm. navigators in Columbus and all of those guys. And then before that, it was land with the Greeks. It was primarily earth that was the, the primary element. So he too does these models uh, where he'll break epochs down into these different understandings of being. I don't think you can understand Sloterdijk without understanding Heidegger. So uh, you should really do that first and then move into uh, for uh, for Sloterdijk and start with his book, Neither Sun Nor Death, which is a series of conversations with him. And for Heidegger, I would not start with Being in Time. I would start with uh, the the two anthologies. Or if, you, if you're intent on understanding uh, being in time, get the lecture series, History of the Concept of Time, which he uh, gave at exactly the same time that he's writing the book. Mm. The content is identical, but much more readable because he's oh, got a classroom. He's got a classroom in front of him. He has to be clear. So it's it's very readable. Uh, so that, that would be a good substitute for being in time, uh, which is how I sort of got around it. But the Heidegger Reader is really excellent by Gunter Fiegels. Uh, mm. And it's meant as a supplement, of course, to the standard basic writings. If you put both of these two together and you read the essays through them chronologically, uh, you get a pretty good idea of the of the overarching career of Heidegger without having to read every single thing. John, this has been really interesting. I mean, it's th this is my first time getting into the thought of either person at all. And so it's been really helpful for me. Thank you so much for this. Yeah, that was great. As always, uh, Brendan, I always appreciate that. Uh, fantastic. Uh, I can't wait to see how you put it together. Awesome. All right. Uh, John, thank you so much again. Have a great Absolutely. weekend. Enjoy yours as well. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.